First of all, what is syphilis? To quote Wikipedia, syphilis is a sexually transmitted infection that may also be transmitted from mother to baby during pregnancy or at birth, resulting in congenital syphilis. The primary stage classically presents with a single canker, a firm, painless, non-itchy skin ulceration, usually between 1 and 2 centimeters in diameter, though there may be multiple sores. In secondary syphilis, a diffuse rash occurs, which frequently involves the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. There may be also sores in the mouth or vagina. In latent syphilis, which can last for years, there are few or no symptoms. In tertiary syphilis, there are gummas, soft, non-cancerous growths, neurological problems, or heart symptoms. Syphilis was present in the Americas before European contact, and it may have been carried from the Americas to Europe by the returning crewmen from Christopher Columbus's voyage to the Americas. The first written records of an outbreak of syphilis in Europe occurred in 1494 or 1495 in Naples, Italy, during a French invasion in the Italian War of 1494-98. to Since it was claimed to have been spread by French troops, it was initially called the French disease by the people of Naples. In 1530, the pastoral name Syphilis, the name of a character, was first used by the Italian physician and poet Girolamo Fracastoro as the title of his Latin poem in Dactylic Hexameter, describing the ravages of the disease in Italy. It was also called the Great Pox. Primary syphilis is typically acquired by direct sexual contact with the infectious lesions of another person. Approximately two to six weeks after contact, with a range of 10 to 90 days, a skin lesion, called a canker, appears at the site and this contains infectious spirochetes. This is classically, 40% of the time, a single, firm, painless, non-itchy skin ulceration with a clean base and sharp borders approximately 0.3 to 3 centimeters in size. The lesion may take on almost any form. In the classic form, it evolves from a macule to a papule and finally to an erosion or ulcer. Occasionally, multiple lesions may be present, around 40%, with multiple lesions being more common when co-infected with HIV. Lesions may be painful or tender, 30%, and they may occur in places other than the genitals, around 2 to 7%. The most common location in women is the cervix, 44%, the penis in heterosexual men, 99%, and anally and rectally in men who have sex with men, 34%. Lymph node enlargement, frequently 80%, occurs around the area of infection, occurring 7 to 10 days after the canker formation. The lesion may persist for 3 to 6 weeks if left untreated. Secondary syphilis occurs approximately 4 to 10 weeks after the primary infection. While secondary disease is known for the many different ways it can manifest, symptoms most commonly involve the skin, mucous membranes, and lymph nodes. There may be a symmetrical, reddish-pink, non-itchy rash on the trunk and extremities including the palms and soles of the feet. The rash may become maculopapular or pustular. It may form flat, broad, whitish, wart-like lesions on mucous membranes, 
known as condyloma latum. All of these lesions harbor bacteria and are infectious. Other symptoms may include fever, sore throat, malaise, weight loss, hair loss, and headache. Rare manifestations include liver inflammation, kidney disease, joint inflammation, periostitis, inflammation of the optic nerve, uveitis, and interstitial keratitis. The acute symptoms usually resolve after three to six weeks. About 25% of people may present with a recurrence of secondary symptoms. Many people who present with secondary syphilis, 40 to 85% of women, 20 to 65% of men, do not report previously having had the classical canker of primary syphilis. Latent syphilis is defined as having seriologic proof of infection without symptoms of disease. It develops after secondary syphilis and is divided into early latent and late latent stages. Early latent syphilis is defined by the World Health Organization as less than two years after original infection. Early latent syphilis is infectious as up to 25% of people can develop a recurrent secondary infection during which spirochetes are actively replicating and are infectious. Two years after the original infection, the person will enter late latent syphilis and is not as infectious as the early phase. The latent phase of syphilis can last many years, after which, without treatment, approximately 15 to 40 percent of people can develop tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis may occur approximately 3 to 15 years after the initial infection and may be divided into three different forms. Gummatous syphilis, 15 percent, late neurosyphilis, 6.5 percent, and cardiovascular syphilis, 10 percent. Without treatment, a third of infected people develop tertiary disease. People with tertiary syphilis are not infectious. Gummatous syphilis or late benign syphilis usually occurs 1 to 46 years after the initial infection, with an average of 15 years. This stage is characterized by the formation of chronic gummas, which are soft, tumor-like balls of inflammation which may vary considerably in size. They typically affect the skin, bone, and liver, but can occur anywhere. Cardiovascular syphilis usually occurs 10 to 30 years after the initial infection. The most common complication is syphilitic aortitis, which may result in aortic aneurysm formation. Neurosyphilis refers to an infection involving the central nervous system. Involvement of the central nervous system in syphilis, either asymptomatic or symptomatic, can occur at any stage of the infection. It may occur early, being either asymptomatic or in the form of syphilitic meningitis, or late as meningovascular syphilis, general pariasis, or tabes dorsalis. Meningovascular syphilis involves inflammation of the small and medium arteries of the central nervous system. It can present between 1 to 10 years after the initial infection. Meningovascular syphilis is characterized by stroke, cranial nerve palsies, and spinal cord inflammation. Late symptomatic neurosyphilis can develop decades after the original infection and includes two types, general pariasis and tabes dorsalis. General pariasis presents with dementia, personality changes, delusions, seizures, psychosis, and depression. Tabes dorsalis 
is characterized by gait instability, sharp pains in the trunk and limbs, impaired positional sensation of the limbs, as well as having a positive Romberg's sign. Both tabes dorsalis and general pariasis may present with argyle Robertson pupil, which are pupils that constrict when the person focuses on near objects, accommodation reflex, but do not constrict when exposed to bright light, pupillary reflex. So, now that we know what the disease being experimented with was, what then was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? Again, from Wikipedia. The Tuskegee experiment was a study conducted between 1932 and 1972 by the United States Public Health Service, PHS, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, on a group of nearly 400 African Americans with syphilis. The purpose of the study was to observe the effects of the disease when untreated, though by the end of the study medical advancements meant it was entirely treatable. The men were not informed of the nature of the experiment, and more than 100 died as a result. The Public Health Service started the study in 1932 in collaboration with Tuskegee University, then the Tuskegee Institute, a historically black college in Alabama. In the study, investigators enrolled a total of 600 impoverished African-American sharecroppers from Macon County, Alabama. Of these men, 399 had latent syphilis, with a control group of 201 men who were not infected. As an incentive for participation in the study, the men were promised free medical care. While the men were provided with both medical and mental care that they otherwise would not have received, they were deceived by the PHS, who never informed them of their syphilis diagnosis and provided disguised placebos, ineffective methods, and diagnostic procedures as treatment for bad blood. The men were initially told that the experiment was only going to last six months, but it was extended to 40 years. After funding for treatment was lost, the study was continued without informing the men that they would never be treated. None of the infected men were treated with penicillin, despite the fact that, by 1947, the antibiotic was widely available and had become the standard treatment for syphilis. The study continued under numerous public health service supervisors until 1972, when a leak to the press resulted in its termination on November 16th of that year. By then, 28 patients had died directly from syphilis. 100 died from complications related to syphilis. 40 of the patients' wives were infected with syphilis. And 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. The 40-year Tuskegee study was a major violation of ethical standards and has been cited as arguably the most infamous biomedical research study done in U.S. history. Its revelation led to the 1979 Belmont Report and to the establishment of the Office for Human Research Protections, OHRP, and federal laws and regulations requiring institutional review boards for the protection of human subjects in studies. The OHRP manages this responsibility within the United States Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Its revelation has also been an important cause of distrust in medical science and the U.S. government amongst African Americans. On May 16, 1997, President Bill Clinton formally apologized on behalf of the United States to victims of the study, calling it shameful and racist. Quote, 
What was done cannot be undone, but we can end the silence, he said. Quote, we can stop turning our heads away, we can look at you in the eye, and finally say, on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful, and I am sorry. End quote. Nazi physicians and their assistants forced prisoners into participating. They did not willingly volunteer and no consent was given for the procedures. Typically, the experiments were conducted without anesthesia and resulted in death, trauma, disfigurement, or permanent disability, and as such are considered examples of medical torture. Experiments conducted included experiments on twins, bone, muscle, and nerve transplantation experiments, head injury experiments, freezing experiments, malaria experiments, immunization experiments, epidemic jaundice, mustard gas experiments, sulfonamide experiments, seawater experiments, sterilization and fertility experiments, experiments with poison, incendiary bomb experiments, high altitude experiments, blood coagulation experiments, and electroshock experiments. At Auschwitz and other German camps, under the direction of Edward Wirths, selected inmates were subjected to various hazardous experiments. Erebert Heim conducted similar medical experiments at Mauthausen. Karl Wernant is known to have conducted experiments on homosexual prisoners in attempts to cure homosexuality. The Luftwaffe performed a series of 360 to 400 experiments at Dachau and Auschwitz in which hypothermia was induced in 280 to 300 victims. These were conducted for the Nazi High Command to simulate the conditions the armies suffered on the Eastern Front as the German forces were ill-prepared for the cold weather they encountered. Many experiments were conducted on captured Russian soldiers. The Nazis wondered whether their genetics gave them superior resistance to cold. Approximately 100 people were reported to have died as a result of these experiments. In early 1942, prisoners at Dachau concentration camp were used by Sigmund Rascher in experiments to aid German pilots who had to eject at high altitudes. A low pressure chamber containing these prisoners was used to simulate conditions at altitudes of up to 20,000 meters, 66,000 feet. Of the 200 subjects, 80 died outright, and the others were executed. Other experiments included experiments on twins, such as sewing twins together in an attempt to create conjoined twins, an experiment in repeated head injury, which drove a boy insane, experiments at Buchenwald, where poisons were secretly administered in food, experiments to test the effect of various pharmaceutical preparations on phosphorus burns induced with material from incendiary bombs, experiments at Ravensbrück to investigate the effectiveness of sulfonamide after infection with bacteria, such as Clostridium perfringens, the causative agent in gas gangrene, and Clostridium 
tetani, the causative agent in tetanus. Experiments conducted to attempt treatments of chemical burns induced by mustard gas and similar compounds, and experiments at Dachau to study various methods of making seawater drinkable. Many of the subjects died as a result of the experiments, while many others were executed after the tests were completed to study the effects post-mortem. Those who survived were often left mutilated, suffering permanent disability, weakened bodies, and mental distress. The results of the Dachau freezing experiments have been used in some modern research into the treatment of hypothermia, with at least 45 publications having referenced the experiments since the Second World War. This, together with the recent use of data from Nazi research into the effects of phosgene gas, has proven controversial and presents an ethical dilemma for modern physicians who do not agree with the methods used to obtain this data. Several Nazi experimenters were, after the war, employed by the United States government in Operation Paperclip and later similar efforts. After the war, these crimes were tried at what became known as the Doctor's Trial, and the abuses perpetrated led to the development of the Nuremberg Code of Medical Ethics. During the Nuremberg Trials, 23 Nazi doctors and scientists were tried for the unethical treatment of concentration camp inmates, who were often used as research subjects with fatal consequences. Of those 23, 16 were convicted. 15 were convicted for the unethical treatment, while one of them was only convicted of SS membership. Seven were condemned to death. Nine received prison sentences from ten years to life, and seven were acquitted. The Milgram Experiments on Obedience to Authority Figures was a series of social psychological experiments conducted by Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram. They measured the willingness of study participants, men in the age range of 20 to 50, from a diverse range of occupations with varying levels of education, to obey an authority figure who instructed them to perform acts conflicting with their personal conscience. Participants were led to believe that they were assisting an unrelated experiment in which they had to administer electric shocks to a learner. These fake electric shocks gradually increased to levels that would have been fatal had they been real. The experiment found, unexpectedly, that a very high proportion of subjects would fully obey the instructions, albeit reluctantly. The experiments began in July 1961 in the basement of Lindsley Chittenden Hall at Yale University, three months after the start of the trial of German Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. Three individuals took part in each session of the experiment. The experimenter, who was in charge of the session. The teacher, a volunteer for a single session. The teachers were led to believe that they were merely assisting, whereas they were actually the subjects of the experiment. And the learner, an actor and confederate of the experimenter, who pretended to be a volunteer. The subject and the actor arrived at the session together. The experimenter told them that they were taking part in a scientific study of memory and learning to see what the effect of punishment is on a subject's ability to memorize content. Also, he always clarified that the payment for their participation in the experiment was secured regardless of its development. The subject and actor drew slips of paper to determine their roles. 
unknown to the subject, both slips said teacher. The actor would always claim to have drawn the slip that read learner, thus guaranteeing that the subject would always be the teacher. Next, the teacher and learner were taken into an adjacent room where the learner was strapped into what appeared to be an electric chair. The experimenter, dressed in a lab coat in order to appear to have more authority, told the participants this was to ensure that the learner would not escape. In a later variation of the experiment, the Confederate would eventually plead for mercy and yell that he had a heart condition. At some point prior to the actual test, the teacher was given a sample electric shock from the electroshock generator in order to experience firsthand what the shock that the learner would supposedly receive during the experiment would feel like. The teacher and learner were then separated so that they could communicate but not see each other. The teacher was then given a list of word pairs that he was to teach the learner. The teacher began by reading the list of word pairs to the learner. The teacher would then read the first word of each pair and read four possible answers. The learner would press a button to indicate his response. If the answer was incorrect, the teacher would administer a shock to the learner, with the voltage increasing in 15 volt increments for each wrong answer. If correct, the teacher would read the next word pair. The volts ranged from 15 to 450. The shock generator included verbal markings that vary from slight shock to danger severe shock. The subjects believed that for each wrong answer the learner was receiving actual shocks. In reality there were no shocks. After the learner was separated from the teacher, the learner set up a tape recorder integrated with the electroshock generator which played previously recorded sounds for each shock level. As the voltage of the fake shocks increased, the learner began making audible protests, such as banging repeatedly on the wall that separated him from the teacher. In every condition, the learner makes, says, a predetermined sound or word. When the highest voltages were reached, the learner fell silent. If at any time the teacher indicated a desire to halt the experiment, the experimenter was instructed to give specific verbal prods the prods were in this order. Please continue, or please go on. The experiment requires that you continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice. You must go on. Prod 2 could only be used if prod 1 was unsuccessful. If the subject still wished to stop after all four successive verbal prods, the experiment was halted. Otherwise, the experiment was halted after the subject had elicited the maximum 450 volt shock three times in succession. The experimenter also had prods to use if the teacher made specific comments. If the teacher asked whether the learner might suffer permanent physical harm, the experimenter replied, Although the shocks may be painful, there is no permanent tissue damage, so please go on. If the teacher said that the learner clearly wants to stop, the experimenter replied, Whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly, so please go on. In Milgram's first set of experiments, 65%, 26 of 40, of experiment participants administered the experiment's final massive 450 volt shock, and all administered shocks of at least 300 volts. Subjects were uncomfortable doing so, and displayed varying degrees of tension and stress. These signs included sweating, trembling, stuttering, biting their lips, groaning, 
and digging their fingernails into their skin, and some were even having nervous laughing fits or seizures. Fourteen of the forty subjects showed definite signs of nervous laughing or smiling. Each participant paused the experiment at least once to question it. Most continued after being assured by the experimenter. Some said they would refund the money they were paid for participating. The Stanford Prison Experiment, SPE, was a role play and simulation held at Stanford University in summer 1971. It was intended to examine the effects of situational variables on participants' reactions and behaviors in a two-week simulation of a prison environment. Stanford psychology professor Philip Zimbardo led the research team who conducted the experiment. The first official day of the experiment was August 15, 1971. The experiment began with prisoners being arrested in their own neighborhoods by real Palo Alto police. Some guards exhibited abusive behavior toward prisoners, which led Zimbardo, at the urging of Christina Maslach, to stop the experiment before it was due to conclude. The study was canceled six days later, on August 20th. After debriefing with his guards and prisoners, Zimbardo analyzed the data and published his findings. The study was funded by the U.S. Office of Naval Research to understand antisocial behavior. The United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps wanted to investigate conflict between military guards and prisoners. After receiving approval from the university to conduct the experiment, study participants were recruited using an ad in the Help Wanted section of the Palo Alto Times and the Stanford Daily newspapers in August 1971. Seventy-five men applied, and after screening assessments and interviews, 24 were selected to participate in a two-week prison simulation. The applicants were predominantly white, middle class, and appeared to be psychologically stable and healthy. The group of subjects was intentionally selected to exclude those with criminal backgrounds, psychological impairments, or medical problems. On a random basis, half of the subjects were assigned the role of guard nine plus three potential substitutes, and half were assigned to the role of prisoner, also nine plus three potential substitutes. They all agreed to participate for a seven to fourteen day period for fifteen dollars per day. The experiment was conducted in a thirty-five foot, ten point five meter section of the basement of Jordan Hall, Stanford's psychology building. The prison had two fabricated walls, one at the entrance and one at the cell wall, to block observation. Each cell, 6 times 9 feet, or 1.8 by 2.7 meters, had room enough for three, a cot, with mattress, sheet, and pillow for each prisoner, and was unlit. Prisoners were confined 24 hours a day. In contrast, the guards lived in a different environment separate from the prisoners. The guards were given access to special areas for rest and relaxation. Zimbardo took on the role of the superintendent and an undergraduate research assistant, David Jaffe, took on the role of the warden. Sunday, August 15th. The prisoners were arrested at their homes or assigned sites, charged with armed robbery and burglary 
Penal Codes 211 and 459. The local Palo Alto Police Department assisted Zimbardo's team with the simulated arrests and conducted full booking procedures on the prisoners at the Palo Alto City Police Headquarters, which included warning of Miranda rights, fingerprinting, and taking mug shots. All of these actions were video documented by a local San Francisco TV station reporter traveling around in Zimbardo's car. Meanwhile, three guards prepped for the arrival of the inmates. The prisoners were then transported to the mock prison from the police station, sirens wailing. In the Stanford County Jail, they were systematically strip-searched, given their new identities, inmate identification number, and uniform. Prisoners wore uncomfortable, ill-fitting smocks and stocking caps, as well as a chain around one ankle. Guards were instructed to call prisoners by their assigned numbers, sewn on their uniforms, instead of by name, thereby dehumanizing prisoners. The prisoners were then greeted by the warden, who conveyed the seriousness of their offense and their new status as prisoners. With the rules of the prison presented to them, the inmates retired to their cells for the rest of the first day of the experiment. Monday, August 16th. Guards referred to prisoners by their identification and confined them to their small cells. At 2.30 a.m., the prisoners rebelled against guards' wake-up calls of whistles and clanging of batons. Prisoners refused to leave their cells to eat in the yard, ripped off their inmate number tags, took off their stocking caps, and insulted the guards. In response, guards sprayed fire extinguishers at the prisoners to reassert control. The three backup guards were called in to help regain control of the prison. Guards removed all of the prisoners' clothes, removed mattresses, and sentenced the main instigators time in the hole. They attempted to dissuade any further rebellion using psychological warfare. One of the guards said to the other that, These are dangerous prisoners. Tuesday, August 17th. In order to restrict further acts of disobedience, the guards separated and rewarded prisoners who had minor roles in the rebellion. The three spent time in the good cell, where they received clothing, beds, and food, denied to the rest of the jail population. After an estimated twelve hours, the three returned to their old cells that lacked beds. Guards abused their power to humiliate the inmates. They had the prisoners count off and do push-ups arbitrarily restricted access to the bathrooms, and forced them to relieve themselves in a bucket in their cells. Prisoner number 8612 began to show signs of a mental breakdown. He began screaming in rage. Upon seeing his suffering, research assistant Craig Haney immediately released number 8612. Wednesday, August 18th. Witnessing the guards divide prisoners based on their good or rebellious behavior, the inmates started to distance themselves from one another. Rioters believed that other prisoners were snitches, and vice versa. Other prisoners saw the rebels as a threat to the status quo since they wanted to have their sleeping cots and clothes again. Prisoner number 819 began showing symptoms of distress. He began crying in his cell. A priest was brought in to speak with him, but number 819 declined to talk and instead asked for a medical doctor. After hearing him cry, Zimbardo reassured him of his actual identity and removed the prisoner. When number 819 was leaving, the guards cajoled the remaining inmates to loudly and repeatedly decry that Number 819 is a bad prisoner. Thursday, August 19th. 
The day was scheduled for visitations by friends and family of the inmates in order to simulate the prison experiments. Zimbardo and the guards made visitors wait for long periods of time to see their loved ones. Only two visitors could see any one prisoner, and only for just ten minutes while a guard watched. Parents grew concerned about their son's well-being and whether they had enough to eat. Some parents left with plans to contact lawyers to gain early release of their ward. On the same day, Zimbardo's colleague Gordon H. Bauer arrived to check on the experiment and questioned Zimbardo about the independent variable in play. Furthermore, Christina Maslach visited the prison that night and was distressed by observing the guards abusing the prisoners, forcing them to wear bags over their heads. She challenged Zimbardo about his lack of caring oversight and the immorality of the study. Finally, she made evident that Zimbardo had been changed by his role as superintendent into someone she did not recognize and did not like. Her direct challenges prompted Zimbardo to end the SPE the next day. Friday, August 20th. Due to Maslach's outrage, the parents' concerns, and the increasing brutality exhibited by guards in the experiment, Zimbardo ended the study on day six. Zimbardo gathered the participants, guards, prisoners, and researchers, to let them know that the experiment was over, and arranged to pay them the full fee for 14 days, $210. Zimbardo then met for several hours of informed debriefing, first with all the prisoners, then the guards, and finally everyone came together to share their experiences. Next, all participants were asked to complete a personal retrospective to be mailed to him subsequently. Finally, all participants were invited to return a week later to share their opinions and emotions. Later, the physical components of the Stanford County Jail were taken down and out of the basement of Jordan Hall as the cells returned to their usual function as grad student offices. Zimbardo and his graduate student research team, Craig Haney and Curtis Banks, began compiling the multiple sources of data that would be the basis for several articles they soon wrote about their experiment, and for Zimbardo's later expanded and detailed review of the SPE in The Lucifer Effect. 2007. Behavioral sync is a term invented by ethologist John B. Calhoun to describe a collapse in behavior which can result from overcrowding. The term and concept derive from a series of overpopulation experiments Calhoun conducted on Norway rats between 1958 in 1962. In the experiments, Calhoun and his researchers created a series of rat utopias, enclosed spaces in which rats were given unlimited access to food and water, enabling unfettered population growth. Calhoun coined the term behavioral sink in his February 1, 1962 report in an article titled Population Density and Social Pathology in Scientific American on the Rat Experiment. He would later perform similar experiments on mice from 1968 to 1972. Calhoun's work became used as an animal model of societal collapse, and his study has become a touchstone of urban sociology and psychology in general. In the 1962 study, Calhoun described the behavior as follows, quote, Many female rats were unable to carry pregnancy to full term or to survive delivery of their litters if they did. An even greater number, after successfully giving birth, 
fell short in their maternal functions. Among the males, the behavioral disturbances ranged from sexual deviation to cannibalism, and from frenetic overactivity to a pathological withdrawal from which individuals would emerge to eat, drink, and move about only when other members of the community were asleep. The social organization of the animals showed equal disruption. The common source of these disturbances became most dramatically apparent in the populations of our first series of three experiments in which we observed the development of what we called a behavioral sink. The animals would crowd together in the greatest number in one of the four interconnecting pens in which the colony was maintained. As many as 60 of the 80 rats in each experimental population would assemble in one pen during periods of feeding. Individual rats would rarely eat except in the company of other rats. As a result, extreme population densities developed in the pen adopted for eating, leaving the others with sparse populations. In the experiments in which the behavioral sink developed, infant mortality ran as high as 96% among the most disoriented groups in the population. While Calhoun was working at the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, or NIM, in 1954, he began numerous experiments with rats and mice. During his first tests, he placed around 32 to 56 rats in a 10 by 14 foot case in a barn in Montgomery County. He separated the space into four rooms. Every room was specifically created to support a dozen matured brown Norwegian rats. Rats could maneuver between the rooms by using the ramps. Since Calhoun provided unlimited resources, such as water, food, and also protection from predators as well as from disease and weather, the rats were said to be in rat utopia, or mouse paradise, another psychologist explained. Following his earlier experiments with rats, Calhoun later created his mortality-inhibiting environment for mice in 1972, a 101-inch by 101-inch square cage for mice with food and water replenished to support any increase in population, which took his experimental approach to its limits. In his most famous experiment in the series, Universe 25, population peaked at 2,200 mice and thereafter exhibited a variety of abnormal, often destructive behaviors. By the 600th day, the population was on its way to extinction. The 1962 Scientific American article came out at a time at which overpopulation had become a subject of great public interest and had a considerable cultural influence. Calhoun had phrased much of his work in anthropomorphic terms in a way that made his ideas highly accessible to a lay audience. Calhoun himself saw the fate of the population of mice as a metaphor for the potential fate of humankind. He characterized the social breakdown as a spiritual death, with reference to bodily death as the second death, mentioned in the biblical verse Revelation 2.11. Calhoun retired from NIM in 1984, but continued to work on his research results until his death on September 7, 1995. The specific voluntary crowding of rats to which the term behavioral sink refers is thought to have resulted from the earlier involuntary crowding. Individual rats became so used to the proximity of others while eating that they began to associate feeding with the company of other rats. Calhoun eventually found a way to prevent this 
by changing some of the settings and thereby decreased mortality somewhat, but the overall pathological consequences of overcrowding remained.